Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back to more Conversations in the Digital Age. Each year in our show, Richard Haas, for the past 13 years, president of the Council on Foreign Relations, has taken us on a tour of the world's trouble spots and indicated his view of the policies that will best assure the national security of the United States. 2016 is, of course, the year of a presidential election, and Richard has recently written an insightful piece for Time entitled The Inbox of the Next Commander-in-Chief, in which he sees a world in disarray and discusses some of the harsh global realities facing the 45th president to be elected in November. Richard Haas is with us again to elaborate on this inbox and why, with the Middle East unraveling with the possibility of a nuclear arms race, continuing terrorist threats from al-Qaeda and ISIS, the potential of a new Cold War with Russia or possibly China, Asia's economic slowdown coupled with an increasingly assertive China, North Korea threatening to launch a hydrogen bomb that would destroy Manhattan Island, and unresolved issues of free trade and protectionism, to name but a few. The outcome of this year's presidential race could prove to be one of the most important in American history. Richard, we're delighted to have you with us. All I can say is, oi. <laughs> Hear that list, you wonder why anybody wants to drive. <laughs> exactly. Director of National Intelligence uh, Jim Clapper uh, just recently told Congress that North Korea was our greatest national security uh, priority. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, it's quite possible that sometime during the, the next presidency, certain if the next president's a two-term president, we will get up one day, and unless something intervenes, North Korea will have the ability to take nuclear weapons, make them sufficiently small to put them on ballistic missiles that can reach parts, if not all, of the continental United States. And the next president will then have to decide, is this something we're prepared to tolerate? Uh, are we prepared to live, if you will, with a, a balance of terror with one of the most dangerous leaders and regimes in the world? If not, we may have to think about how do we avoid reaching that point or what we would do if, uh, if we were to reach that point. But that's certainly on anybody's short list uh, of, of the national security challenges facing us. Again, not simply regionally, but as you point out, globally. Uh, what do you think our options are with North Korea? Well, what can we do? Well, one option goes through Beijing. The Chinese, even though they say they don't have much leverage, do. Most of North Korea's trade transits mainland China. Would they be prepared under certain circumstances to put much more pressure on North Korea, even risk bringing down the regime? And the question is, could we give them certain understandings or reassurances about the transition and what would come out of a transition in terms of a unified Korea that they might see that as less bad? Uh, than, than the status quo or something that could lead to a war. If that doesn't work, then at some point we may have to think about under what circumstances we would use military force. The alternative to using military force or China that pressures North Korea is to enter into some type of a situation of deterrence, uh, missile defense, and so forth, and that just makes me uneasy given the nature of this regime. The one thing I'd say, Jim, is I have zero confidence that some combination of sanctions and negotiations are going to, to resolve this for us. We've, we've looked to that for decades, and all I know is that during that time, North Korea is still there, the regime is still there, and their nuclear program has grown dramatically. They have used these talks as a, as a cover for advancing their nuclear program. So I think we, we ought not to kid, us, kid ourselves that this most recent U.N. resolution or any U.N. resolution is going to do the trick here. So uh, North Korea, any discussion with North Korea inevitably leads you uh, to China. And uh, what is uh, our relationship with China now? I mean, it seems that uh, it's become more difficult. You just returned from Asia. It's complicated. It's got various dimensions to it. It's, it's not easy to pigeonhole. It's not purely adversarial. It's obviously not purely cooperative. It's got elements of both, and that's part of the challenge. In some ways, it's, it's less difficult to deal with a country that's a one-dimensional foe then you know how to deal with it. You've got a cookbook. But a country like China, we've got areas or venues of cooperation, potentially on some proliferation questions, potentially on climate. We obviously have a large interdependent economic relationship, but then we obviously disagree in areas. We have real heartburn with what the Chinese are doing in the South China Sea. And elsewhere. Are we headed for a showdown there? Not necessarily. And I would think that one of the goals of American foreign policy ought to be that we don't have a showdown with China. This century is going to be plenty tough without having uh, the structure of a new Cold War between the world's two most powerful countries. So if we can avoid it, it takes two to avoid it, but if it can be avoided, it's obviously in our interest to sort of maintain the kind of relationship 
we've had with China, which at least holds open the possibility and at times the reality of selective areas of, of cooperation. But uh, the situation is, uh, as it often is, is somewhat muddled there, isn't it? Because their economy is in decline. Mm -hmm. The whole Asian economy is in decline. Maybe the worldwide economy is sure. in decline. No, but at the same sense. time, they've become more assertive. And there's a, there's a school of thought that thinks that the two might even be linked, that as China faces increased economic problems, the economy slows, nobody I know believes the official numbers, that there might be those in Beijing who are looking for a more assertive foreign policy to compensate for the loss of legitimacy and public support that previously was derived from ever higher standards of living. We've got to guard against that. And I think what we need to do is push back against China, where we see signs that they are uh, encroaching. On the other hand, we've got to make it clear that there's a place for China in the region, the world, that is fully consistent with legitimate and reasonable Chinese uh, ambitions. But yeah, I think we've got to be prepared, not just for a China that's slowing down economically, not just for a China that's getting a little bit more assertive in its foreign policy, but also for a China that's cracking down at home politically. We're beginning to see signs of that. Again, it's probably linked to the economic slowdown. There's a zero tolerance, as best I can see from afar, for, for, for significant dissent. So again, I would think that in the inbox of the new president will be this very complicated situation of a China that's slowing economically, getting more repressive politically, and getting somewhat more assertive in foreign policy. That's going to be a tough relationship to manage. But when their economy was red hot, booming and zooming, the concern was they'd become more nationalistic and more assertive. So uh, any way you boil it, uh, they're assertive. It reminds me a little bit of that old comment by Harold Brown when he was asked about the uh, Soviet Union and the United States in an arms race. And he said, all I know is that when we build, they build. And when we don't build, they build. And in a funny sort of way with China, either way, you're likely to see a more nationalist China, either out of pride or out of compensation for, a, uh, again, a slowing economy. What we need to, again, is do is push back and make it clear that that will not be a path towards satisfaction, but that China still very much has a path towards a, a, a wonderful or what a reasonable future, so long as it essentially acts regionally and internationally in, in, in a way that's consistent with, with restraint and rules. Now, uh, how about uh, the Trans-Pacific uh, Trade Pact? You, in the past, you've supported it. Uh, you well, I am a not bad supporting it. it. I'm, a, I'm a fervent supporter of it. Uh, I believe that uh, even though individual workers obviously lose jobs because of free trade uh, on occasion, other workers gain jobs because of free trade, the export uh, market. Free trade also gives consumers much more choice. It lowers inflationary pressures. And strategically, it's one of the glues, both between the United States and our allies, but also it's a part of interdependence. It gives uh, bulwarks against countries thinking of uh, upsetting the apple cart. So on balance, I'm a great believer in trade. And for those who are hurt, that's where I get into things like wage insurance or various types of education and retraining uh, accounts. We've got to have all that to make sure that those who are affected, again, have a, have a new chance. I'm worried, though, because the top four candidates right now, both uh, Democratic candidates and the two leading Republican candidates, are all against free trade. And this has been an important source of uh, strength, I believe, for the United States over the, over the decades. It did enjoy considerable bipartisan support that seems to have gone by the wayside. And I worry that if we don't go ahead with the TPP that you mentioned, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, it will reinforce doubts that are already out there in the world about American reliability and predictability. These doubts stem from our domestic dysfunction. They stem, for example, from what President Obama said he would do and then didn't do in Syria. The red line. Exactly. So if we can't follow through on this trade agreement, I believe the repercussions in Asia and globally potentially go way beyond the pluses and minuses of the agreement itself. Now, uh, there's a distinction, isn't there, between uh, trade, which might cause the loss of jobs, and trade agreements, which might actually promote jobs. Well, and certainly, also, our tariffs, or the barriers here, we've already lowered them. So the main advantage of this agreement, others would lower them to us. So I think, on balance, it's a, it, it, it's a good agreement. And I think, in many cases, trade is getting a bad rap. Yes, a lot of Americans lost jobs, for the most part, though, not from trade agreements. In many cases, it's simply from the advance of technology. Thanks to technological innovation, now you need fewer people if any, in some cases, to do what a lot of people used to do. So that, that, to me, argues for training, education. So workers who had a job that, for whatever reason, was eliminated, are then repositioned themselves to get new and better jobs. That's got to be our commitment as a society.
We're already committed uh, to two major trade agreements anyway, the North American Free Trade Agreement and also the agreement with South Korea. Oh, we're, uh, so we're committed to any number, uh, and even, I would say, the one in North America, NAFTA, which is wildly controversial. It's contributed to U.S., Canadian, and Mexican economic growth. And ironically enough, one of the reasons there is not more immigration anymore from Mexico is that this has been good for the Mexican economy. It's contributed to the economic growth rate of the Mexican economy, and that, along with smaller families in Mexico, have meant that more Mexican young men in particular have stayed home. And that's simply a reality. Again, I'm not sitting here saying trade agreements are perfect. I'm not sitting here saying there aren't workers who are adversely affected. Of course there are. And there we've got to intervene to help them. But on balance, I believe the trade agreements have been good for the United States. Now, uh, in 2010, Obama, through his then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, announced a pivot toward Asia. Now, in the past, you've quarreled with that term. Uh, it's a little bit too angular for me. It suggests too dramatic a departure, but I'm not quarreling. It's a basketball term. Uh, it's among other things. Mm -hmm. But I'm not quarreling with the basic concept, though, that the United States has been for, what, a decade and a half now, overly involved in the greater Middle East, a degree of what I would call strategic distortion. The future of the world, the 21st century, is much like, more likely to be determined in Asia. That's where the wealth is. That's where the powerful nation states are. That's where the population is. So I do believe in the idea of rebalancing, but doing slightly less in the greater Middle East and slightly more out in, the, uh, in Asia. I think that strategically was the best idea of the Obama foreign policy. And my, my quibble with it was not the concept, but as is often the case with the implementation it was rather incomplete and halting. But the basic idea that the United States would do more in that part of the world, and that means more militarily, more presence, much more diplomatically, and have the trade agreement, I think is very much in our interest. Now, you wrote in the time piece <clears throat> that the Middle East, which you just mentioned, is unraveling. Uh, how is it unraveling, and uh, what's the way forward? Well, how isn't it unraveling? Uh, what we see, basically, is the, the order in the Middle East, whether you want to call it the post-World War I order, or the order that existed before the Arab Spring five plus years ago when that started, however you want to call it, that is coming apart. Those borders are counting for less. You have a failed state in Syria, a failed state in Libya. You've got something like a failed state in Iraq and in, in Yemen. Uh, you've got you know, Iran's nuclear program, which was capped but in no way uh, eliminated by the, uh, by the agreement. Turkey is suffering all sorts of domestic challenges. You've got the Kurds in, in Syria and in Iraq thinking about uh, a state of their, their own. I think you've got major domestic challenges vis-a-vis -vis order in Egypt, potentially future challenges in Saudi Arabia when a group like ISIS challenges it. Jordan is dealing with this enormous burden of uh, refugees, as are several other states. You've got the unresolved Israeli-Palestinian question. I could go on and on, but I see none of the prerequisites of success either within countries in the region or between and among them. And the analogy I think I introduced several years ago now uh, was that of the 30 Years War. Essentially political religious struggles within and across boundaries. And I see, alas, no reason to, to be optimistic. I don't think uh, it's close to burning out, whether it's Sunni, Shia, whether it's Persian, Arab. I worry that this, uh, there's enough fuel that this could continue for, for years to come or even longer. Well, uh, you mentioned Iran. Uh, was the Iran deal a good deal for the United States? It's not the deal I would have negotiated. I think we could have negotiated a better deal. Uh, I still don't understand why we agreed to accept limits on centrifuges and enriched uranium for only 10 and 15 years, respectively. I believe we should have insisted on a much uh, longer deal. That said, uh, it's and the only deal we have. So what I would think right now... The well, what about allowing the missiles uh, in, the, there's an, in the near term? Uh, again, lots of problems with the Israel deal. Israel written on the, well, on the nose cone. You've got the missiles that are, in some ways aren't covered. You've got their ability to start getting in the arms market again. There's lots of aspects of the deal that give me major uh, heartburn. I would think going forward, though, we need to insist, obviously, that Iran comply with the deal. I think we've got to be very sure and work very hard that its neighbors don't initiate nuclear programs of their own against to hedge against the uncertainty of what will come after the deal. And so that would be a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Which we is certainly don't want that. Just when you thought the Middle East couldn't get worse, it could. And we ought to be thinking very hard about what comes after the deal. The Middle East has been uh, thought of as the heartland of terrorism, particularly Islamic terrorism.
And we just saw just today another instance of it with the horrific events in Brussels mm -hmm. uh, following San Bernardino and Paris and, and Ankara. Uh, what are the, our options there? How can we uh, put a stop to this? There's no single answer or solution. I think terrorism, alas, is now part of the, uh, the woodwork. It's part of the new normal or new abnormal, if you will. But there's things you can do. You can obviously put groups like ISIS and the rest. If, if you can't put them out of business, you can at least put them on the defensive with things we could do in the region. There are things we have got to do to make our borders more secure. But then once you have populations within societies, whether it's in Brussels or in California, then you've really got to think hard about how you assimilate populations, how you integrate them. We've also got to think about something, and this is closer to your world than mine, the balance between individual liberties and privacy on one hand and what we do in the name of collective security on the other. What's the role of law enforcement and homeland security and intelligence agencies? I think we've got to get that balance. It's illustrated by the Apple case, but this will Absolutely. be decided in the courts or decided elsewhere. What, yeah, it might be decided in somebody's workbench. Yes. But, uh, but I think, again, there's no single answer to this, but this is... We've got to work it. I think where the Europeans pay a price is a bad combination of the openness of their borders relatively and then the lack of effective internal security in many ways. And then you've had populations that haven't been effectively assimilated. And they really are way too isolated in these societies. One of the advantages of the United States, we're not perfect, but I believe we are much better in this area, is we have done a better job of integrating minority populations, integrating immigrant populations. And the best thing then is that these, these communities, in some cases, look after themselves. Should it be a national security uh, uh, objective of the United States, a strategy to destroy ISIS Should once be an, and for all? Look, I'd love to destroy ISIS uh, and groups like it. I think we also, though, have to be realistic that if it's not ISIS, it'll be al-Qaeda. If it's not al-Qaeda, it'll be al-Nusra. There's, there's going to be a degree of disaffected people out there who are going to have extreme agendas, who are going to have access to various types of uh, capabilities. So to me, a more realistic goal is how do we minimize it and then how do we deal with it? How do we make ourselves uh, less vulnerable? How do we make ourselves more resilient? What do we do in the name of homeland security, law enforcement, military? How do we discourage young men and women from being recruits in the first place? So it's, it's one of these things that you work in many venues and you work over various timelines. Uh, let's uh, talk about another uh, country in the Middle East, uh, Syria. Uh, Putin, uh, just uh, a week ago or so, uh, took a page from uh, that of another uh, Vermont senator, George Aitken, and he declared victory and decided to start to go home. Uh, do you think that uh, Syria was a success for the Russians, and is the drawdown a success for the United States? Well, what the Russians did was they intervened with considerable force uh, to shore up the regime, and they succeeded. They had very limited, they had fairly heavy means and fairly limited goals. And what they did was they avoided, though, trying to pacify the entire country. They weren't trying to make all of Syria functional or viable again, and they certainly weren't trying to transform it. There must not be a phrase for nation building in uh, Russian and the whole idea that uh, a country that's as authoritarian as Russia would try to promote democracy is preposterous. And this Certainly no phrase for regime change. They don't like that. <laughs> they don't like that either. So what you had was regime shoring up. And I would say it, uh, it succeeded. This was, a, I don't know how to say the Powell Doctrine in Russian, but however you say it, uh, the Doctrinsky seemed to oh, have no, been... Oh, no, the, the Putin Doctrine now. Well, but, uh, but uh, fairly unlimited means for fairly limited ends. And the Russians have reduced their, their level of involvement, not eliminated. They haven't withdrawn. They've drawn down. And I think for Mr. Putin, it was a pretty good demonstration of Russia's willingness and ability to act in a decisive uh, fashion. He kept the costs of it down in terms of uh, human costs or financial costs. It's made him a player in the future of Syria. So I think he's got to be feeling pretty good. We have to, you know, my, my problem was not per se was shoring up the regime. We didn't want to have immediate collapse. We, were, you know, we weren't ready for the collapse of the regime. We didn't want to create a vacuum of authority in Damascus that the Islamic State could have uh, exploited. But no one wants to see the perpetuation of this regime. So the real question is whether Russia at some point, and if so, under what terms, would be prepared to think about a, a political transition. My guess is, and if I'm on your show a year from now, we're going to have a Syria that looks kind of like this one. You're going to have a Syria where the government's controlled of one piece of real estate, ISIS another, Nusra another, the Kurds another. It's going to look like the old Ottoman Syria in some ways of cantons or various parts. You're, you're not going to have a contiguous 
country in any meaningful sense of the word. You're going to have a country of what I call, a, it's a nation state made up of nations. And I think that's what Syria is going to look like for some time to come. Well, uh, Obama said at the beginning of this uh, several years ago that uh, the objective of the United States was Assad must go. Uh, should we adhere to a policy of Assad must go? Is that a policy? Well, it, it's a pronouncement, not a policy. And the gap between the pronouncement and the policy is one of the sources of our failure there. We talked before about the red lines. You know, when we then made specific uh, commitments, we weren't willing to follow through on them. So Syria, historians are going to have a field day with Syria. And it's going to be a debacle, and it will be one of the worst parts, I'm sad to say, of Mr. Obama's tenure. And it'll be one of the most negative parts of, of his legacy. So we can still have the hope that Mr. Assad must go. We should think very hard, though, about what would take its place, and we should think even harder about what, what we are prepared to do to increase the odds that he does go and he's replaced by something better. But to simply, a you know, foreign policy, though, can't simply be uh, a series of sound bites. Mubarak must go, Assad must go, this guy must go. You've got to be prepared to narrow the gap between your pronouncements and your policies. Or Gaddafi must go. It really didn't get us anywhere. So, uh, well, we're worse off than we are. Yes. We are worse off and Libya's worse off. I don't think the situation in Libya ever warranted the intervention. The lack of follow-up made absolutely no sense. Plus, what we did is we sent a terrible message to the world. If you give up nuclear weapons, you become more vulnerable. What kind of a message is that? Gaddafi had been the poster child of denuclearization. And years later, we go in and remove him. That, to me, does as much to work against our goal, stopping the spread of nuclear weapons, as anything else. Do you see anything uh, favorable for the U.S. in Putin's uh, withdrawal or partial withdrawal? Oh, what, I, what I would ask is the question of what, he, what, what is then step two or three or four. And uh, is he prepared at some point, and if so, under what terms, to look for some type of a political transition in Syria? So the answer is maybe. I wouldn't bet the farm on it, but I'd certainly be open to talking to him about it. And it's quite possible that if we were to continue to give him some political space and some credit, uh, I wouldn't be against some type of a joint U.S.-Russian diplomatic initiative if I thought there was a chance that could lead to an outcome that would be consistent with our interests. Uh, we just learned that uh, Obama has ordered uh, additional American troops on the ground in Iraq, at least fighters uh, have been uh, noted in Iraq. Uh, do you favor uh, more troops on the ground in the Middle East? Uh, only a limited number, and that would be really for the purposes of training, advising, and so forth. But if the real challenges in the Middle East are going after groups like ISIS, no, I don't want that to be principally an American uh, undertaking. Because even if we were to defeat them, quote-unquote, militarily, we need forces in place that can then hold the territory so some other group doesn't exploit the, the vacuum. That means we need local partners. So the, the key to our policy, the, the thrust of our policy, needs to be to identify and strengthen local partners, not have us do the, the lion's share of the fighting. Now, okay, we've got to wind down, but we are in the midst of a presidential campaign. You've served three presidents? Four. Four presidents. Uh, and uh, uh, you certainly have some opinions on this. Uh, what are the qualities and qualifications that you think uh, go into a, uh, a great foreign policy president? Well, the best one I've worked with was 41, Ger George Herbert Walker Bush, and the way he handled the end of the Cold War, the Gulf War, and, and so forth. What you want to do is have someone who has uh, experience, judgment, some knowledge of the relevant history, and has also good judgment in people. Uh, his senior lieutenants, Jim Baker, Brent Scowcroft, and so forth. Richard Haas. Well, on a much more junior level. That was an extraordinary uh, team. And, but there's intangibles. But you want, obviously, knowledge, you want judgment, and you want someone who's going to be careful. The United States is uh, the leading power in the world. And we've got to be very conscious of what we do and don't do. Uh, but I think we have to recognize that this world is not going to organize itself without us. We've got a lead. That's not an argument for unilateralism, but it is an argument for us being uh, involved. But we've got to be careful, and we've got to understand we can't do everything everywhere. So we've got to be smart in where we choose. So again, I keep coming back on judgment and a very strong team surrounding the president at the White House. Judgment and a strong team. Now, I have a question for you, Richard Haas. Uh, what should be at the top of the pile in the inbox of the next president of the United States? Well, it's going to be a very high inbox. It's going to be... Uh, we talked about one, which is uh, North Korea, 
talked about China, talked about stabilizing uh, Europe. And I'd also say contrast maybe to what some would think. We also do have to look at domestic issues. We've got to look at the base of American power. We should be growing much faster. We've got to look at the quality of our schools. We've got to look at our infrastructure. We've got to look at immigration. We've got to look at uh, homeland security. We've got to look at all the things that make us strong so we also then have the means and the focus and the capacity to, be, to play an active role in the world. And a ninth justice on the Supreme Court of the United States. Richard Haas, thank you so much for coming by. This has been just wonderful. Thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more Conversations in the Digital Age. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.